So thank you all for coming out today. Uh, as Jamie said, I spent a lot of time at the Library of Congress digging up uh, old bills and statutes uh, on compulsory licensing. Uh, this is going to be a historical overview of compulsory licensing statutes in the United States. Uh, going to look at uh, bills that have been proposed since the early 1900s up through the present and uh, some statutes that have been implemented. So just to start out, uh, there's a few different uh, types of compulsory licenses in the United States. Uh, there's compulsory licenses for government use, uh, for federally funded research and development. Uh, there are compulsory licenses in specific industries, such as uh, in uh, uh, clean air and uh, atomic yeah. energy. Uh, there are compulsory licenses that have been implemented or proposed in war and national security contexts uh, for antitrust and under the eBay case. Uh, and some of these will be discussed later, uh, as Jamie mentioned uh, today. So I won't get too in-depth into some of these. Um, the reasons that people have proposed compulsory licensing statutes in the past are broad. Uh, in the early 1900s, uh, there were compulsory licensing statutes that were, or in bills that were proposed uh, in terms of the non-use of patents and competition. People were worried that uh, patents weren't being uh, manufactured, patented inventions weren't being manufactured in the United States or processes weren't being used. Uh, there were competition issues uh, related to cross-licensing and patent pooling. Uh, and this was in the context of uh, the 1883 Paris Convention, which was a broader patent agreement that included provisions on compulsory licensing. Uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act had been passed also in the late 1800s, and there was rapid industrialization and concerns about uh, expanding U.S. industry. Uh, then during the World Wars, uh, there were uh, some proposals for compulsory licenses in the context of national security and defense. Uh, Following the wars, uh, the, the government had invested a lot in research and development and worked with industry and universities, and uh, there were proposed compulsory licenses to address that. And then finally, starting in around the 60s, uh, up until the present, there have been various uh, bills proposed to do a general compulsory licensing statute on medicines, usually in the context of drug pricing. And here's the Paris Convention uh, provision, which I won't talk about because I think Fred's going to talk about that a little later uh, on compulsory licensing, just to have in the presentation here. So we'll start with government use. Uh, here's the statute. Uh, I'm not going to go too in-depth into... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I have my computer here, and I'm following along with the slides, and I forgot to push this. Um, here's the text of the government use statute. Uh, I'm not going to go too in-depth into what the text says, uh, because that's going to be discussed in the next panel, but I will talk about the history a little bit. Uh, it starts in the late 1800s. In 1875, there was a renovation of the U.S. Capitol, and uh, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted was the architect of the Capitol at the time, and his contractor used a patented method for pouring concrete, uh, and so the patent holder, who was named Schillinger, sued the United States government for uh, the infringement of that patent, and the Supreme Court held that uh, the statutes uh, allowing for suit against the United States government as a waiver of the government's sovereign immunity did not allow for tort suits, and so Schillinger could not sue the U.S. government. Uh, this was affirmed in 1901 in Russell v. U.S., where the court explicitly said it is the prerogative of a sovereign not to be sued at all without its consent or upon such causes of action as it chooses. It is not chosen to be sued in an action sounding in tort, and they said that a uh, patent infringement suit would be a tort suit, so they did not allow suits against the government. In 1910, uh, Congress passed legislation to remedy this situation. Uh, it was uh, proposed by Philander C. Knox, who was former Secretary of State and Attorney General, who served twice in two non-consecutive terms in the Senate uh, between his stints in, in three different presidential administrations. Uh, and the, the legislation allowed for an infringement suit against the U.S. government for recovery of reasonable compensation. Then in 1918, uh, there was another case, William Cramp and Sons Ship and Engine Building Co., the International Curtis Marine Turbine Company, uh, in which the court ruled that government contractors could not be sued under the government use statute. Uh, so FDR wrote to Congress, and he said that manufacturers are being exposed to expensive litigation involving the possibilities of prohibitive injunction payment of royalties, 
et cetera. And so he requested that they amend the government use statute to cover infringement by contractors, and in 1918, Congress did so. There are some other government use provisions that have been uh, proposed uh, and that are exist in U.S. law, including for uh, USAID uh, in 1961, the Tennessee Valley Authority in 1933, and some of the other uh, R&D uh, statutes allow for government use. So in 1912, uh, Congress started to explore patent legislation that was proposed by the Wilson administration. Uh, the patent commissioner, Edward B. Moore, proposed a remedy for the suppression or withholding of patents. Uh, the hearings were between April and May of 1912, and they were led by Representative William Allen Oldfield, uh, who, who ran the House Committee on Patents. Uh, and the bill addressed various issues, including the independence of the Patent Office, patent exhaustion and the patent bar, but also compulsory licensing. So I'm just going to summarize the compulsory licensing provision in the bill. It allows any person to request a license from the patent holder if the patent holder has not been adequately used after four years from the start of the patent term. Uh, any person demanding it shall be entitled to a license from the patent, uh, owner of the patent unless the owner shall show sufficient cause for such inaction, and it allowed appeal to the district court if the patent holder denied a license request. Uh, uh, and it required the court to grant the license if the court was satisfied that the reasonable requirements of the public uh, were not being satisfied by reason of the neglect or the refusal of the patentee or their authorized persons to make, use, or vend the invention or to grant licenses. And it required uh, the setting of just terms. Uh, so most of the hearings in 1912, although it was a broader patent reform bill, focused on the compulsory licensing provision. There was a debate over the proper remedy to the non-use of patents. Some people thought it should be a compulsory license. Some people thought you should just revoke the patent if it wasn't being used. Uh, and some witnesses even proposed alternative compulsory licensing provisions that were more directed towards public interest uses of patents. So, for example, uh, the New York City Railroad between uh, New York and New Haven uh, was required to use electric rail uh, because of uh, smoke pollution in the city, and uh, there was a patent issue with that, uh, and they had to end up spending a lot of money paying uh, to use the patents. Here's what the... Uh, uh, Commissioner Patton said in his testimony, uh, I'm not going to read all of this aloud, but uh, he made the point that nearly all countries except the United States have had patent provisions at the time that required the working of a patent invention, and they provided either for the revocation of that patent or a compulsory license. Uh, and he proposed compulsory licensing rather than revocation, uh, partly because of the compensation issues involved in it. Uh, after the hearings, Representative Oldfield presented an amended bill uh, providing that the licensee would have to prove that the patent holder had withheld or suppressed the invention for the purpose or with the result of preventing other person from practicing the invention. And between 1912 and 1915, other members also proposed compulsory licensing provisions that were not discussed in the Oldfield hearing, but that were, uh, um, so they were a little bit different. For example, uh, there's an interesting 1912 bill by Francis Burston Harrison, which would have allowed for the taking, uh, it would have created a subordinate property right in the patent, and it would have allowed for a taking of uh, that subordinate property right uh, for anyone who owned uh, a similar patent and was prevented from using that patent by the original patent, or uh, for improvement patents, or for public use. Uh, and there was also another version that would have instead required uh, cross-licensing between patent holders. So 10 years later, uh, the Oldfield Committee did not uh, get any bills passed in Congress, by the way, I should say that. And same in 1922, they again discussed compulsory licensing. There were, was no bill passed, but it was an interesting conversation that happened uh, in Congress. Uh, the U.S. Department of War proposed a uh, compulsory licensing statute that would have provided that any patent uh, uh, would have a provision within the patent, so similar to the uh, uh, by Dole Act requirement that you state in the patent if there's federal funding. Uh, there would have been a provision in every patent that said if it's not work to put into operation uh, so as to result in actual production in the United States uh, within a reasonable time, which was defined as no less than two years nor more than five years, then the U.S. Uh, would reserve the right to license the patent to any person to manufacture, use, and sell the subject matter. And it would require the payment of a reasonable royalty, which was defined as not less than 0.5% nor more than 10% of the manufacturer cost of each article. Um, 
the Department of War proposed this statute because, or this bill, because it feared that uh, foreign control patents would hinder U.S. industry uh, leading into the next war. So this was just after World War I. Uh, and before World War I, the, uh, uh, a representative of the uh, Judge Advocate General came and testified, and he said that the Germans controlled patents on coal tar, which was used in dye manufacturing and medicines manufacturing, uh, optical glass, uh, wireless telegraphy, and magnetos. And that after the war, uh, German patent holders uh, during the war were not allowed to file for patents in the United States, but after the war they were allowed to again, and uh, they passed a, a bill called the Logan Act, which allowed them to file for patents that they otherwise would have been able to file for during the war. Uh, so some German inventors came in and patented the entire system of U.S. railroad artillery. So the, the Army was very worried that uh, in the next war, uh, which they were anticipating even in 1922, uh, that uh, the foreign control of patents could be detrimental to U.S. industry. Uh, during the war, Congress also passed a compulsory licensing statute uh, in the Trading with the Enemies Act, which, uh, under which uh, the U.S. seized all uh, enemy property, which was basically German property, but also patents, and they issued compulsory licenses on them to U.S. industry. After the war, they returned the patent rights and uh, with the royalties to the patent holders. Uh, and then uh, following the war in this hearing, Congress also contemplated the new situation. So the Army justified the bill in terms of national defense and the buildup of essential U.S. industries, which they took a very broad view of, everything from car manufacturing to the dye that you would use for soldiers' uniforms. Uh, a lot of large industry groups opposed uh, the uh, uh, compulsory licensing bill. Uh, they feared that it would be used against U.S. industries and not just uh, foreign industries, which was sort of the stated intention of, of, the, of the bill. Um, so... Um, okay, yeah. Moving on to 1938. Uh, again, Congress uh, dealt with compulsory licensing, uh, this time in a subcommittee on compulsory licensing in the House. Uh, Representative W.D. McFarlane and Representative William P. Connery introduced legislation. Uh, this had followed a few years of hearings and an investigation, a uh, really big investigation into the use of cross-licensing and patent pools uh, to limit competition in, in big industry in the United States. And the investigation found uh, that a lot of patents were being cross-licenses in ways that prevented competition from smaller manufacturers. Uh, the McFarland legislation was similar to the earlier legislation, but the Connery legislation was more narrowly tailored towards that end of solving that problem. Another thing they were talking about since this was in the midst of the Depression was employment. They thought that compulsory licensing would let small manufacturers uh, get more jobs into the economy. Uh, so uh, that was another reason they were looking at it. Uh, McFarland's bill would have allowed any qualified applicant to request the Commissioner of Patents grant a compulsory license on a patent after at least three years with proof that it had been, not been used for at least one year, that the public interest would be served and the applicant would have to propose specific terms and conditions. The Connery bill would have allowed any person to file a suit in a district court for a non-transferable license under reasonable terms and conditions when two or more persons, broadly defined as companies and, and uh, other entities, uh, had each brought their, their patents into a single kind of control or trust or something uh, that would prevent, uh, that whereby industry and trade are dominated and interstate commerce is substantially restrained to the detriment of the public. Uh, this time, uh, and they actually remarked on this when they were doing the hearings, uh, they were kind of shocked that none of the big industry groups showed up to oppose the bill. Uh, instead, a lot of small manufacturers and prominent patent attorneys, uh, like the New York State Patent Association and Chicago Patent Association and uh, the American Bar Association and former patent commissioners all showed up to oppose this bill. They argued that it would destroy small manufacturers, uh, that the large... Uh, big industry would just take their patents for non-use. Uh, they were saying, you know, we, we need more than three years to develop our patents even after we've been granted the patents. So uh, this was also killed uh, before it made it to a vote. Uh, Post-World War II, uh, there were two kind of big compulsory licensing statutes. One was industry-specific, the Atomic Energy Act. Uh, under the Atomic Energy Act, uh, the U.S. government actually seized all atomic energy patents in the United States. 
And there's a good quote here from Harold D. Smith, the director of the Bureau of the Budget. He said, if atomic energy is important enough to justify complete governmental control, no aspect of its use should be determined by private monopoly. Uh, so after they seized all the patents, they also included a compulsory licensing provision for other patents that would be useful in the production of atomic energy. So this was only for non-military use, uh, not for uh, building atomic weapons. And it, it created a process that allowed people to uh, appeal to the Atomic Energy Commission for uh, compulsory license on a patent, and this was modified in the 50s to sort of change the process a little bit. Uh, then also, uh, following the war, there was the Marshall Plan in the late 1940s, and the Marshall Plan uh, had a special government use, or, or rather, it was codified in 1951, I should say, uh, and that bill uh, statute had a special government use provision for rebuilding European economy and security. Uh, and uh, then in 1961, the the Congress created USAID to sort of consolidate the functions of uh, the various agencies that had been doing work under the Marshall Plan, uh, and that had a similar government use provision, uh, and it also had a carve-out preventing government use of patented pharmaceuticals outside the United States. Uh, and also, both of those uh, statutes were interesting because they have a uh, special kind of provision that lets the uh, agency head of whoever is using the patent go and negotiate with the patent holder before they file suit in court in the United States. Uh, in 1970, Congress passed the Clean Air Act, am uh, amendments to the Clean Air Act. And uh, those amendments included a special compulsory licensing scheme for compliance with the requirements of the Clean Air Act. And it, it was just kind of inserted into the bill. There was no discussion of it during the hearings. And after, af actually after the bill passed, there were discussions about uh, repealing it. Uh, and uh, they sort of decided that uh, it would just be better to keep it in and see how it works out rather than repeal it and take years of study. They thought it would disrupt the the uh, act. And the way the Clean Air Act amendment works is similar to the uh, atomic energy compulsory license. You apply to the, uh, the government for a compulsory license on clean air technologies, and then there's a little hearing, and then uh, you get the compulsory license if you prove you need it. Uh, in 2000, Dennis Kucinich proposed uh, amendments uh, following a patent dispute between top oil corporations in the U.S. and Unical, which had developed a clean gas technology, and they were also going through uh, a, a case at the FTC on Unical to determine whether they were doing, taking anti-competitive actions. Uh, and uh, Kucinich proposed an amendment that would uh, sort of solve the problem by allowing compulsory licenses on Unical's patents. Uh, so I'm going to move on to government-funded research and development now. Uh, there's this kind of standard provision that's in a lot of uh, laws, and uh, uh, starting in the 60s, uh, it's that no research shall be, if you have a contract with the government, shall be carried out. And the things in brackets are kind of changed between different statutes. Uh, so if you look at one, it might have three out of the four of the first bracket or different words. But the, the gist of it is the same, is that you can't have a research contract with the government unless all of the patents and, and processes uh, are available to the general public. Uh, so here are some of the bills uh, uh, that this, uh, or the statutes that this provision can be found in. Uh, you can see it was in a bunch over the years. Uh, then uh, in 1950, uh, Congress passed uh, the National Science Foundation Act, which uh, created the National Science Foundation as uh, this was following World War II. As I mentioned before, there was a lot of government-funded R&D and collaboration during World War II. Uh, and uh, they decided to create the National Science Foundation to coordinate those R&D efforts. And there was a debate in Congress and in, uh, administration, in the administration about how they should deal with patent issues. Uh, eventually, they decided upon uh, this clause right here, which is that contracts shall contain provisions governing the disposition of inventions that are calculated to protect the public interest balanced with uh, the equities of the uh, contract holder. Uh, then in 1980, 30 years later, uh, Congress passed the Bayh-Dole Act, which uh, changed the uh, uh, way that the government uh, deals with government-funded research and development. Uh, and that contains marching rights. I'm not going to go too in-depth into the 
ways you can use marching rights since that'll be the focus of a later panel, but I will talk a little bit about the history. Uh, it follows Kennedy's 1963 government patent policy, which required where the principal or exclusive rights to an invention are required by the contractor, the government shall have the right to require the granting of a license to an applicant, royalty free, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, for public use by governmental regulations or as may be necessary to fulfill public health needs or for other public purposes stipulated in the contract. And then Nixon's 1971 patent policy required that inventions be reasonably accessible to the public. Uh, so we're moving on now to uh, compulsory licensing on medicines, which is the kind of the thrust of this meeting. So we'll go a little bit through the history of statutes that have been proposed in that area. Uh, in, 19, in 1959, Senator Estes Kefauver, who is most famous for his amendments to the Food and Drug Act, uh, proposed, uh, uh, started some hearings on a wide range of issues, uh, and he wanted to reform the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, he saw a lot of abuse, and, and he didn't think that they were being regulated well enough by the FDA. Uh, so he proposed legislation in 1961, and that legislation inclu included a compulsory licensing provision, and it also included additional antitrust provisions uh, that were unrelated to the compulsory license, but are still interesting. Uh, so the, the, the compulsory licensing scheme that Kefauver came up with would have limited the period of exclusivity for a patented drug to three years. So you get three years of exclusive use of your patent. Then for, so at the time, patents lasted for 17 years. Then for 14 years, uh, the patent holder would be required to grant each qualified applicant an unrestricted license to make, use, and sell the drug. And if they refused, they would have to report to the commissioner on patents. The commissioner on patents would uh, then uh, make a determination based on, could also make a determination if, if somebody complained that they were not given a license. And if they refused, uh, the patent would just be canceled. And here's what Senator Kefauver said uh, at uh, the hearings. He said, uh, one fundamental fact disclosed by our drug hearings, he's referring to the earlier hearings here, uh, at least in my opinions, is that by any test and under any standards, prices and profits in the ethical drug industry are excessive and unreasonable. The problem is all the more serious because it concerns the health and happiness of every citizen in our country. He saw two alternatives, uh, either price control or uh, providing for freer competition, as he called it. Uh, and he chose to uh, uh, increase competition through a compulsory licensing statute. Uh, as you can imagine, there was strong pushback against his compulsory licensing statute, particularly from the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. But the Kennedy industry was also, or the Kennedy administration was also on their side. Uh, and they actually, uh, at one point, killed the bill because of the compulsory licensing statute. So we almost didn't have the Kefauver amendments in the 60s. Uh, but then they kind of maneuvered it back into Congress uh, following this dispute over the compulsory licensing over Kefauver's objections. And uh, the, the amendments passed without the uh, compulsory licensing or antitrust provisions. He reintroduced these provisions with a few modifications uh, in the following year. Uh, it never passed Congress. Uh, and here's the, the amendments that he made to his bill following the hearings, uh, which was that uh, any qualified applicant could request a license on a patented drug. Uh, for which the patents have been issued at least three years prior to the date of the application and when the price of the drug is 500%, so five times the cost of production, which included the cost of manufacturing uh, the drug, the research cost, or the research uh, um, the research revenues that go back in, the revenues that go back into research at the company uh, and uh, a few other factors, and it would have allowed the applicant to request the FTC to grant a compulsory license. So it's, it's different from what he initially proposed. Uh, in 1979, Senator Gaylord Nelson, who's most famous for creating Earth Day and being a big environmental activist, uh, sort of followed in Kefauver's footsteps and proposed another compulsory licensing bill uh, in his attempt to do broader reform of the pharmaceutical industry and also deal with some of the antitrust issues. Uh, this followed the expansion of compulsory licensing provision in Canada in 1969, uh, and his bill was called the Public Health Price Protection Act. It contained a really complex and strange compulsory licensing scheme, which I'll go into right now. It would have required the Surgeon General to issue a certification or the Federal Trade Commission to initiate a public rulemaking procedure if there was evidence that a drug had a high price and that other criteria were met. The certification criteria were uh, first continued availability of the drug would be in the public interest or the drug is the choice uh, of 
uh, drug of choice for particular clinical uses. Second, that the drug has a substantial market. And third, that there are either fewer than four producers, which, which would be the case for most patented drugs, or that the average price of the drug was higher than five times the cost of manufacturers. So that was the same standard that was in the Kefauver legislation. Uh, and the Federal Trade Commission uh, could trigger their uh, rule-making uh, procedure if uh, the average price of the drug was five times higher than the cost of manufacture or higher than the average price of any foreign country. So there was some reference pricing in there. Uh, the annual sales exceeded $1 million for three or more years, and the existence of a patent contributed to the high price of the drug. Uh, if mandatory licensing of a drug on reasonable terms and condition would, con would contribute to lower drug prices, and if a mandatory license would be in the public interest, alternatively, they could have relied on the certification of this information instead instead. Um, uh, so support for this came from Public Citizen and Ralph Nader, uh, who was actually the first person to testify in the hearings, uh, uh, and uh, along with Dr. Sidney Wolf. Uh, uh, but opposition again came from the pharmaceutical industry, uh, uh, the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association in particular, and other industry groups. These hearings covered a range of issues, so the compulsory licensing issues weren't brought up too much at the hearings, but uh, they did voice their opposition. And they made similar arguments at both this hearing and the hearing in the 60s that they make today, which is that it will destroy innovation, that it will, uh, uh, you know, uh, harm uh, U.S. industry, that it will destroy jobs, et cetera. So getting to more recent uh, compulsory licensing proposals uh, for, for pharmaceuticals, in 1994, Representative Gerald Nadler proposed a compulsory licensing bill in response to the controversy over RU486, the abortion pill. Uh, Rossel Ulaf, I probably mispronounced that, the French company that held the patent on RU486 refused to let uh, U.S. Uh, company uh, or U.S. nonprofit actually do clinical trials because uh, they were afraid of anti-abortion activists boycotting uh, their other products in the United States. Uh, and so Nadler, uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, pro-abortion activists, uh, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times and said we should just revoke the patents. And Nadler wrote a letter to the editor in response and said, next week I'm proposing a compulsory licensing bill, and that's a much better way of doing this. And his compulsory licensing bill would have allowed the Secretary of Health and Human Services to determine after notice and an opportunity for hearing that the owner of the patent uh, has not taken all reasonable steps toward the commercial marketing or use of the product, uh, and that the availability of the product is of vital importance to the public health and welfare. And it would have required the secretary to notice, notify the commissioner of patents of any determination, and then the commissioner would do the compulsory licensing. In the 90s and 2000s, then Representative Sherrod Brown, now Senator Sherrod Brown, uh, proposed a few compulsory licensing statutes. Uh, and uh, I'm just noticing, actually, that the PowerPoint's a little screwed up, but that was from transferring from Google Docs to this, so I apologize for that. Uh, in 1999, he proposed the Affordable Prescription Drugs Act in response to uh, higher spending in Medicare and other programs that provide drugs to low-income people and, and senior citizens. Uh, uh, he said the legislation is not designed to produce artificially low drug pr prices, so he addressed the concerns of the industry that it would you know, destroy the pipeline, uh, and he said that it was designed to correct unjustifiably high prices. In 2001, he proposed a similar piece of legislation, and uh, also in 2001, right after 9-11 uh, uh, and the anthrax scares, he proposed the Public Health Emergency Medicines Act. So the uh, Affordable Prescription Drug Act, proposed in 1999, would have allowed the Secretary of Health and Human Services to issue compulsory licenses on medicines if the patent holder, contractor, licensee, or assignee had not taken or is not expected to take effective steps to achieve practical application. Uh, uh, if a compulsory license is necessary to alleviate health or safety needs, uh, and if, or if the patented material is priced higher than may be reasonably expected based on criteria developed by the Secretary of Commerce. Uh, the uh, licensee would also have had, to, had prior negotiations, uh, except in cases to remedy anti-competitive practices, and it would have allowed for termination of the license if and when the circumstances that led to the license ceased to exist and were unlikely to recur. Uh, uh, the Public Health Emergency Medicines Act allowed the secretary to authorize the use of a patent invention related to health care uh, if the secretary determined that the invention was needed to address a public health emergency. Uh, and what's interesting about this statute are some of the remuneration standards, uh, which uh, address uh, the costs of R&D, uh, the uh, evidence of efficacy, et cetera, some 
good standards here. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them right now. And finally, in 2015, Senator Bernie Sanders proposed uh, an amendment that would have allowed uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs yeah. to negotiate, uh, or to rather to issue compulsory licenses uh, on medicines uh, after they blew out their budget on sofosbuvir, the uh, hepatitis C drug. Uh, and the interesting thing about this piece of legislation is that uh, it would have allowed them to account for the budget constraints in setting the royalty rate. Uh, so I'm going to end here uh, and open it up to questions. on it doesn't seem to be um, you can hear me oh, okay all right um, be sure to uh, introduce yourself so everybody knows who you are thank you Ashley Stevens focus IP group I thought that was outstanding review Zach um, my review of Kafalva mm -hmm. was very much that yes he was looking seriously at, at uh, compulsory licensing and price controls and thalidomide happened and all they cared about and what got done in those amendments was safety um, well, Kefauver seemed to really care about the compulsory licensing. I mean, he proposed the legislation after the, the amendments passed. Um, it was strong opposition from the administration in my reading of what happened and, uh, and from the uh, industry that sort of killed the compulsory licensing provision. But it, it seems like he did care about, yeah, you're right, the, uh, the uh, changes in safety and efficacy standards, but he also really cared about the compulsory licensing and pricing. I mean, he titled his hearings the uh, uh, antitrust uh, drug hearings, so he, he cared a lot about anti-competitive practices and, uh, and uh, issues of price. There was a great book called The Million Dollar Bug <laughs> about antibiotic production that led to Kefalfa down that pathway. Thanks. Um, first. Uh, thank you for doing this. I have some sense of how much work must have gone into this, um, and I hope that you um, might be able to put a bunch of this online, and, yes, and I think the old definitely. bill text will be really interesting, mm -hmm. and it's fascinating to see uh, how everything uh, old is new again, or everything new is also old, um, uh, uh, and there's a lot of really interesting examples there. I have a very um, geeky question about mm -hmm. one uh, provision in particular. So when you mentioned the Atomic Energy Act and the taking of patents, um, explicitly, do you, was there compensation in that context? I believe that there was. I don't remember what the compensation standards were, but yeah, I, I believe that there was compensation. Um, and I, that would be, I guess, interesting to know in part thinking ahead to what mm -hmm. will undoubtedly be takings conversations mm -hmm. um, in anticipating the way some of this could, could go forward. Definitely. Just a brief comment. Thank you, Zach. That was fantastic. My understanding of what was initially driving Kefava was comparisons of prices with prices in Europe and the differential management of patents. That was what initially prompted the uh, his. Uh, I think he had a lot of motivations. <laughs> yeah, but I think it was it was I think it's interesting the point about the comparison with European prices. Mm -hmm. That's um, probably worth. Well, in the original uh, legislation, uh, he did not have uh, a sort of reference price uh, standard, and then no, it wasn't uh, yeah. that, that it was part of the, the legislation. It was part of the the, the conversation. The conversation yeah. mm -hmm. that prompted the discussion was the was people pointing out the comparisons with prices in Europe, where patenting standards were mm -hmm. significantly less. That, that's right. It was. An Italian, and back then Italian, Italy had no patent statutes worth talking about. And uh, there was an offer to supply oreomycin that had been made, I think, with a pirated strain that led to it. Hence that book, The Million Dollar Bug. Uh, Chris Gallagher, IP Strategic. Thank you for doing this. This is very helpful. In your historical scan, um, is there a point where the issue of use morphed into pricing? Or it, it sounded, as you went through it, as though it happened just after Gaylord Nelson and, and perhaps somewhere around Kefauver, but then it reverted back to use and availability. It sounded like 
to me. Would you just comment on, on In terms of the medicines? Yes. Compulsory licensing? Yeah. Um, it seems like price has always been part of the concern there um, in, the, in the compulsory licensing on, on uh, statutes on, on drugs, or bills uh, on drugs that have been proposed in uh, the United States. Um, uh, you know, the, and, and maybe the, the Brown bill about the public health emergency might be the, the kind of exception, but uh, that, the, I think Brown was still concerned probably about the price of, of drugs in public health emergencies. Um, so uh, I don't know that it morphed. I think that there's always a range of issues that they're concerned about when they propose legislation on uh, drugs, compulsory licenses. Hello, everyone. Alan Black. I'm the, I was the lawyer for the Fabrizyme shortage patients uh, when they attempted to march in uh, to remedy the Fabrizyme shortage. I had a question regarding sort of the, th I guess, the third alternative, which is obviously available in copyright. Are there any sections that have what you might call fair use provisions? I know that for physicians, they are not, or at least they have a defense to patent infringement where they practice a patented medical procedure, so mm -hmm. they just can't be sued. Right. Is, does that occur in any of these other situations? Um, not that I can remember. Um, I think that's probably one of the few that, that has something like that. Um, but in my review of the compulsory licensing statutes, I think they're all um, with the understanding that there will be litigation over the infringement of the patent. This is Fred Abbott. Assuming that we're talking about the same thing, the, the Hatch-Waxman Act has a very broad research exemption. Uh, that, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I was actually also thinking about something different, which is the uh, personal use importation exemption under the FDA. And although I don't, wasn't widely publicized, there's one example in the context of HIV where an organization provided medicines to a community of people with HIV early on in the epidemic. It was a drug that was patented in the US, expensive in the US, they could get it more cheaply in the UK, and they simply imported it, and the FDA didn't stop them. Um, so uh, it's not, you know, we, could, we could have a longer conversation about what's in those. The FDA doesn't take the view that that form of personal importation is what the kind of enforcement discretion that it offers for patients is for. Um, uh, but it's an interesting question about how far one might go via the FDA enforcement discretion. Uh, when you're talking about a small number of people and a non-institutional non sort of form of addressing this, this problem. This is Jamie Lovett. I, on, on this issue of the relationship between compulsory license and, and exceptions or limitations, I mean, there are a fair amount of limitations and exceptions to patent rights. The, the, the doctors that perform are, are other medical personnel that perform medical procedures. That was actually, by legislation, was considered not an infringement, and uh, or there was no remedy for the infringement. I should say it was an infringement, but with, uh, infringement without a remedy. So there's, there's patentable subject matter is another area that the way that you do that. Sometimes they limitate. Uh, there's limitations on the remedies. Sometimes it's just defined not as an infringement. But the compulsory license, which is really what Zach was focused on, he was trying to focus on areas where there's no controversy over the validity of patent, there's no controversy over whether or not the patent is being used without the permission of the, of the right owner. It was just whether, in what cases where, where is there legislation proposed to permit the non-voluntary use of a patent where there was no dispute uh, on the issue of infringement or, uh, or validity. <laughs> 